Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Rohan Khandelwal, your marrow surgery faculty, and today I'll be talking about the NEET PG 2024 surgery recall. Now, first I'll start with the exam analysis. So session one and session two had equal number of surgery questions. But if we come to the sessions in general, session one was comparatively easier as compared to session two. Session two had lengthier questions, more tricky options and uh, more images in session two, which is why students felt that session two was more challenging. But you know, with normalization, hopefully they're able to resolve the issue and give a rank which is um, fair for everyone. Now, if you look at the surgery questions, when I show you session one and session two, they had actually tried to match them topic wise. So if they had asked one question from say, vac dressing in one session one, they asked, another type of question from vac dressing in session two and they tried to match it out. The really shocking part was the number of urology questions which were there. Now, if you compare previous exams, urology hardly had one or two questions, but this time, especially session one had a lot of urology questions, which was uh, quite surprising. There were less questions from general surgery and trauma in general in both the sessions. There were less questions and there was more focus on systemic surgery and conceptual questions. So that is another key takeaway that the questions were all conceptual. They couldn't have been done, say, five days before. You could just randomly can't read 100 facts and then you can answer these surgery questions. You need to understand the concepts or shortcuts wouldn't have helped in this kind of a surgery paper. Now, with that said, let's start with session one surgery questions. And I've divided them topic wise. Uh, so this is GI and hernia, which I'm starting with. You had a patient with a history of umbilical swelling initially, asymptomatic for many years. And now the patient complains of pain over the swelling. It was reducible initially, and now it has become non-reducible. What is the appropriate management? Now look, the images might vary because we are going by what students have recalled. So the images and the options might vary slightly. So if you think that the options were different, please do write in the comment section and we'll be happy to update it in the Marrow app later on. So clearly you can see that there is an umbilical hernia and this umbilical hernia has become inflamed and it has become irreducible. We know that irreducibility is a sign of obstruction and the fact that it is inflamed is a sign that it might be strangulated. So in such a hernia, the options given were umbilectomy and herniography, umbilectomy only, conservative with antibiotics or incision and drainage. We know these are out. And if there is a hernia, we need to do some repair for it. And we know that we cannot put a mesh when there is infection or strangulation. So we will have to do a herniography repair in which we suture the defect together. Now, you know, an uncomplicated hernia has two hallmarks. It has reducibility and cuff impulse. Obstructed is when there are signs of obstruction and irreducibility. We know the signs of obstruction. We know there will be abdominal pain. We, there will be vomiting, distension. And this is the image which I've shown in the app as well. Strangulated is like obstructed, but the differentiator is that there will be compromised blood supply. And that is why the dictum the line which is written in Bailey, all obstructed hernias should be treated as strangulated unless proved otherwise, right? So once obstruction sets in, we start treating it like a strangulated hernia. And you know there are three types of repairs. You have herniotomy, where we don't do anything to the defect, but there is a high recurrence rate. Then you have herniography, where we suture the defect together, herniography, right? And you have hernioplasty, which is the standard of care, least recurrence. But you know that the mesh materials, synthetic mesh materials, which are commonly used like proline, vipro, cannot be used when there is infection or strangulation. Which is why in obstructed or strangulated hernia, we either use a biological mesh, but that option wasn't there, or we carry out herniography. The biological meshes which can be used are acellular human dermis and acellular porcine dermis. So this question, the answer would have been umbilectomy with herniography. I've explained you the reason why. Now the next question was a CT scan which was shown. 
and they had shown a hydrated cyst and they wanted to know what is the hydrated cyst as per the Garbi's classification. Now this I would say is, we know that we are following the WHO classification more commonly but they asked the old Garbi's classification and if you remember I discussed this in the liver module that CE is according to WHO and Garbi's is a old classification which was there. So CE1 is type 1, this is a unilocular anechoic cyst you can see here, nothing inside, fine. CE2 is type 3, this is the, this is the only catch which is there that this is a multiceptate rosette or honeycomb appearance. So this is honeycomb appearance which is CE2 but it is type 3 according to Garbi's. CE3A is type 2 and this is a cyst with detached membrane or water lily sign and this is what was asked, this is you can see water lily sign or detached membrane. So he, these two you need to remember that there is a discrepancy that CE2 is type 3 and CE3A is type 2. 3B is type 3, CE4 is a cyst with heterogeneous contents and CE5 is type 5. This is a calcified or dead cyst. So the examiner asked the one where there was a change, where the two classifications don't match. So this is what was asked in the exam and because they had asked water lily sign, it is type 2 which is the correct answer here and you had to mark that. This is again you can see water lily sign or detached membrane sign which would be type 2 but CE3A on the WHO classification. Right, so this is from the app. Now this is again an image of CT scan showing multiple hydrated cysts in the liver. This was an easy question, a straightforward question. What is the condition shown here? And they had shown an endoscopy image in which they had asked about esophageal varices. These are varices which are dilated veins which you can see here. Barrett's esophagus, you know, you will see red velvety mucosa, right? We will see red velvety mucosa and this is metaplasia of squamous to columnar epithelium. Ulcers, you will see a crater kind of an appearance and candidiasis, we know that you will see these whitish or reddish patches, whitish patches will be seen and this candidiasis can sometimes mimic esophageal varices but there would usually be a history of oral thrush or oral candidiasis in such patients. So these were classical esophageal varices which I am sure most of you would have got it correct. Again, a repeat question which has been asked so many times in various exams and a pet favorite of examiners that is pylonidal sinus. We know this, they had shown an image like this. In the natal cleft, they had shown sinus cavities and this is known as a pylonidal sinus, right, which is also known as Jeep driver's disease and this is seen in, you know, Jeep driver's disease is seen in patients who are hairy men and due to friction, right, these hairs start growing inside. So it is known as a nest of hair and it can cause multiple sinuses or abscesses in this area. In barbers, in the interdigital clefts also, it can cause pylonidal sinuses, right. We know what hemorrhoids look like. Fissure, you will have a breach there and there will be a history of painful defecation and there can be bleeding as well and fistula you will see openings but they will be lower down, they will be closer to the anal opening. This is high up in the natal cleft, this is a pylonidal sinus and this image has also been asked, you can see the surgery for pylonidal sinus, this is known as a rhomboid or a Limburg flap which has been asked in the INICT and the FMG exam previously as well, so rhomboid or Limburg flap is done for pylonidal sinuses. Congenital diaphragmatic hernia was a pet favorite of INICT. Now they've even asked it in NEAT PG. Once previously in NEAT PG also it had been asked. So most common congenital diaphragmatic hernia seen in neonates, right? 
Now there are two statements first of all and I want to clarify that because often students get confused. So they had given esophageal hiatus as well. You need to remember that hiatal hernia, hiatal hernia is the most common diaphragmatic hernia, right? So overall if you talk about sliding hiatal hernia is the most common diaphragmatic hernia. But here they are asking congenital diaphragmatic hernia, most common congenital diaphragmatic hernia and we know that the most common congenital diaphragmatic hernia is bocadelic or left posterolateral. So this is the correct answer. We know right anteromedial is known as morgagni hernia. So please remember these statements. Bocadelic we discussed is left posterolateral. If is left posterolateral and this is the most common. Morgagni is right anteromedial which we just discussed. Now the embryogenesis also has been asked in some of the exams that for bocadelic hernia there is a defective development of the pleuroperitoneal canal or membrane which is involved in the development of the diaphragm and the most common structure which herniates upwards is the stomach, spleen and transverse colon but stomach is more commonly seen here in, in left-sided congenital diaphragmatic hernias. Morgagni hernia is a right anteromedial and this is due to defective central tendon of the diaphragm, right? And here transverse colon is the most common structure which is going to herniate upwards. This is congenital diaphragmatic hernia imaging where you can see that the bowel has herniated into the thoracic cavity and you can see that the Ryle's tube is also coiling up. And because the bowel is there in the thoracic cavity, it does not allow the lung to develop. So, nowadays congenital diaphragmatic hernia can be diagnosed in utero. In utero, it is diagnosed by imaging and in utero surgery is also there. This has been updated in Sebastian. The in utero surgery is called FETO. FETO is fetal tracheal occlusion right fetal tracheal occlusion this is called feto and this helps in those patients who have congenital diaphragmatic hernia helps in lung development in them because the most common cause of death in congenital diaphragmatic hernia is pulmonary hypoplasia is pulmonary hypoplasia that is the most common cause of death because the bowel is sitting in the thoracic cavity and it does not allow the lung to develop, right? Now, when these children are born, they will have respiratory distress. They have respiratory distress and because all the bowel is sitting in the thoracic cavity, they have a scaphoid abdomen which is there. They have a scaphoid abdomen which is there and the ventilation which is contraindicated in them, this has also been asked many times, is bag and mask ventilation. So, what we need to do is IPPV, intermittent positive pressure ventilation. And as these children grow or few days or weeks or months into their life, what they start developing is pulmonary hypertension. Because of pulmonary vessels undergoing vasoconstriction, hypoxic vasoconstriction, pulmonary hypertension can develop. And that is why inhaled nitrates are being used in these patients to treat the pulmonary hypertension, which is the second most common cause of death in these patients. Now, one question which was asked long time back in the AIMS exam, when it used to be the AIMS exam, is that surgery has to be done. And the surgery, we make a circular incision over the diaphragm, not on the skin, over the diaphragm a circular incision is made and then you do a mesh repair in such patients. Then they had shown an image where they said that a baby has been brought with complaints of discharge from umbilicus and this is fecal discharge which is coming from the umbilicus and they had asked the diagnosis and they had shown an image like this where you could see a tubular structure going from the small bowel and uh, it was going towards the umbilicus, right? So this is classically a patent vitello intestinal duct. Now what you need to understand is that the image was extra. 
just on the basis of history you could have made the diagnosis we know that the vitello intestinal duct is going to connect the ileum to the umbilicus right is going to connect the ileum to the umbilicus so if you have a patent vitello intestinal duct there is a connection between the ileum and the umbilicus and there can be fecal matter which can come out through the umbilicus so this is when the vitello intestinal duct is absolutely patent right through and through from the umbilicus uh, from the ileum to the umbilicus and this is what they had asked so just on the basis of history you could have answered the question now what are the other abnormalities right so other abnormalities this you know is normal when the vitello intestinal duct obliterates right now if the intestinal end of the vitello intestinal duct persists we know this is the meckel's diverticulum and the meckel's diverticulum you are well aware of the rule of two a lot of questions have been asked two percent population two inches long and two feet proximal to the ileocecal junction now sometimes a cyst can remain right when the entire duct on both the ends is obliterated but in the center there is a cyst then sometimes the umbilical end can persist now if the umbilical end persists it forms an umbilical polyp and it can give rise to discharge right pus discharge sometimes blood can also come come out if it becomes infected and sometimes you just have a fibrous band now when there is a fibrous band what can happen that this bowel can rotate around this fibrous band and it can undergo volvulus so these are the various abnormalities of the vitello intestinal duct you know meckel's diverticulum has been asked many times this time they asked a patent vitello intestinal duct then this was a straightforward question a patient of adenocarcinoma stomach who undergoes distal gastrectomy which nutrient should be supplemented in this patient now we know that gastrectomy nutritional complications are very common and the most common nutritional complication is iron deficiency right is iron deficiency because you need acid for the conversion of iron and then later on absorption in the bowel so that conversion does not happen and that is why iron deficiency is the most common deficiency post gastrectomy we know vitamin b12 deficiency can be there because of intrinsic factor deficiency vitamin b12 deficiency can be there and we know that there is vitamin d3 and calcium deficiency also which is there vitamin d3 and calcium deficiency because of improper absorption so the most common is iron deficiency but here they did not give a option of iron they had given b12 c a and calcium so you had to mark b12 deficiency because of deficiency of intrinsic factor that is what had to be marked now you know in inict and fmg they've gone a step further in asking this question where they show a peripheral smear and in the peripheral smear sometimes they have asked about iron deficiency where you know it is going to be microcytic hypochromic anemia microcytic hypochromic anemia or vitamin b12 where they have said that the patient has neurological symptoms and there is megaloblastic anemia which is seen right so you should know about that as well you should know what the peripheral smear images look like then they had asked a question where again they had given a very classical history so just on the basis of history you could have made the diagnosis but the ultrasound image was also quite typical you had a 6 week old neonate who was brought with complaints of recurrent vomiting ultrasound is done and shown below what is the diagnosis now let's look at the options supposing we don't know about the image right and there will be such situations in future exams as well where probably you're not aware of the image or it's not clear or you can't make out what exactly they're trying to show so mid gut volvulus is going to start presenting at birth right at birth the child will have obstruction and vomiting duodenal atresia at birth there is going to be bilious vomiting and we know that if we do an ultrasound here uh, sorry if we do an x ray here we get a double bubble sign we get a double bubble sign annular pancreas also at birth here annular pancreas although the encerclage of the pancreas is around the second part of duodenum but usually it is non bilious 
Remember this please. Usually it is non-bilious. And here also you can get the double bubble sign. Fine. So there is only one condition. Even with the elimination and I don't, I am not even looking at the image. Even with the elimination, I have come to the answer of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis because we know this presents a few weeks later with non-bilious vomiting. In the ultrasound, they had shown an elongated and thickened pylorus is what they had shown. And you know that if the pyloric channel is more than 16 millimeters in length or more than 4 millimeters in thickness, 4 millimeters in thickness, then we can confirm the diagnosis of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So ultrasound is diagnostic of pyloric thickness and length, I have told you, thickness more than 4 millimeters, length more than 16 millimeters. We know the metabolic abnormality in these patients is hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis, alkalosis because the body is losing acid with paradoxical aciduria, with paradoxical aciduria. And you know the best fluid to correct this is N by 2 normal saline plus KCL plus dextrose. But we all know, we've discussed this, that KCL should only be added when urine output is adequate and the kidney function tests are normal. So when you correct the dehydration, then only you add, cal uh, you add KCL. This is the best fluid or we can use Ringer lactate if this is not given. But if best is us, that is what you need to mark. And we carry out Ramstead's pyloromyotomy in these children. So, CHPS has been asked multiple times in the exam. Now, the next question was a female presented with a breast mass as shown and with liver metastasis. What is the management? So, you could see a huge mass, what students have said, which was fungating or there was ulceration which was there and they have said that there are liver metastasis. So, we know we are dealing with a stage 4 disease. And in stage 4 disease, we know the treatment is palliative in nature. We are just trying to control the symptoms. We can't cure the patient. Fine. So, we can't cure these, patient, these patients. And in such a patient, primarily because of the ulceration or the fungation, we are concerned. So, let's look at the options what they had given. They had given simple mastectomy. Neoadjuvant. Neoadjuvant is when I am treating with a curative intent. So, if it was a locally advanced breast cancer where there were no metastases, then neoadjuvant followed by surgery. But here it is metastatic. Here the intent is only palliative. Modified radical mastectomy and radical mastectomy are out because what you need to remember is that operating the primary, operating the primary in metastasis in breast cancer does not change the survival, does not change survival. There are exceptions to this rule. There is something known as oligometastatic disease where there are less than five lesions and in certain sites where surgery can improve survival for some time but with liver meds and such a lesion, the removal of the primary will not improve the survival. So why am I removing the primary? because the patient has fungation. So, that kind of a mastectomy is known as simple mastectomy or we used to call it toilet mastectomy, right? And this is what I have taught you in the Marrow app as well. Toilet mastectomy is a simple mastectomy. Simple means I am not removing the lymph nodes which is done in palliative procedures in fungating cancer. So, that is what we will carry out here. There is no role of neoadjuvant because the intent is palliative, right? A patient of oral cancer underwent radical surgery with a PMMC flap reconstruction. PMMC, you know, is pectoralis major myocutaneous flap. What is the important indicator of adjuvant radiotherapy? Now, here there is a confusion because students are unable to recall the options. And some are saying it was all except. Some are saying that uh, these were the options. So, this question, I still haven't been able to get the clear options. I will tell you the theory regarding this. And this was one of the questions regarding the updates in Bailey. And you know, I had recorded these Bailey update videos. And from the Bailey updates only, there were three questions which were asked in this exam. 
So those updates are extremely important going forward for future exams as well. And this, this were the ones which I had covered. So adjuvant therapy for oral cancers, this is from the latest Bailey. The high risk features are ENE, this is extra nodal extension. This is extra nodal extension. LVI, which is lymphovascular invasion, which is lymphovascular invasion. You have closed or involved margins and PNI, which is perineural invasion, perineural invasion, right? So these are the high risk features in oral cancer. Now let's look here. They had given closed margins. They had given extra nodal extension. They had given multiple lymph nodes. So all are indications for adjuvant therapy. Now if you look at adjuvant therapy, radiotherapy, one major in the form of extra nodal extension and or involved margins, right? Or two minor closed margins, multiple involved lymph nodes, largest node more than three, LVI, PNI or T3, T4 disease. Now, if we just go by this, then the best answer here would be extra nodal extension because this is this they've given out as one major sign. Okay. But otherwise, you will see that all of the following, all of them are indications for adjuvant treatment. But if we just consider the major factor, then I would mark extra nodal extension as the best answer. And this was based on the Bailey update videos. So the next question from head and neck was regarding cleft lip and cleft palate. Now again here, there is a discrepancy in the images which students have shared. In some of the images, it was uh, given as only a cleft lip and in some it was cleft lip plus soft palate, right? So again, I'm not sure what which image was exactly asked, but I'm just going to tell you the concept behind both of them. And what everyone has said that the question was, what is the earliest age at which surgery can be done, right? So surgery for cleft lip, cleft soft palate and cleft hard palate. So cleft lip, we carry out the Millard repair, which is the most common repair. And this can be done at three to six months of age. So the earliest age is three months, is, uh, is three months, right? In the old Bailey, they had also given a rule of 10. They had also given a rule of 10 where they said 10 weeks, 10 pounds weight and 10 gram percent hemoglobin and 10 gram percent hemoglobin. Right. So this was the old Bailey. The latest Bailey says, latest Bailey says that you can do the surgery by five to six months along with soft palate, along with soft palate repair. Clear? Hard palate, everyone says that you have to wait for at least 12 to 15 months because you have to wait for the bony growth of the hard palate. So now coming back to the question and for palate repair, we do a VY plasty. This is also known as a von Langenbach repair. This is known as von Langenbach repair. That is what is done. I have ta taught you about VY plasty. That's a type of a random flap which is done. Now, if the image only showed cleft lip, right, I would be happy in marking three months. But if it was lip plus soft palate, then I would prefer marking six months as the answer. So based on what the image was, I would mark the answer accordingly. Next was a straightforward question. Uh, they had asked about papillary thyroid cancer, they had shown often anionide nuclei on a histopathology slide and instead of asking uh, surgical management or histopathological features, they had asked which is the most commonly mutated gene and we know it is the BRAF gene, this I have highlighted, this is from marrow only, you can see most common gene with papillary thyroid cancer is the BRAF gene, papillary thyroid cancer is the most common thyroid cancer, more common in females and radiation exposure is a risk factor. Now, these radiation exposure induced papillary thyroid cancers are more aggressive, right? 
It can even be seen in a long-standing thyroglossal cyst, tends to be multifocal, multiple points of origin, and lymphatic spread is to the level 6 lymph nodes. Hematogenous spread can be to the lungs. So here they had asked about the gene and you had to mark the BRAF gene here. RET proto-oncogene, we know RET gene is associated with medullary thyroid cancer, right? Is associated with medullary thyroid cancer and MEN2 syndrome also, you can see RET proto-oncogene mutation. So medullary thyroid cancer. Next, moving on to the urology questions. I told you a lot of urology questions were asked in the exam. Which instrument is required for the following procedure? So the instrument, first of all, let's see what the diagnosis is. So this was a DJ stent. And if you remember, I have shown you this DJ stent X-ray KUB. And I always used to joke that these are not worms. These are DJ stents. Now DJ stent stands for double J stent. Double J stent, where do we put it? So double J stent, you can see here that the, this was the image from the marrow app and I had shown this video of PCNL being done and in the video I had shown you that first the DJ stent is put in and to put in this DJ stent, we use a cystourethroscope. We use a cystourethroscope. Even a cystoscope is enough, right? So if you talk to urologists, they'll say even a cystoscope is enough, but that was not there in the option. In the option was cystourethroscope, so you have to mark that. So what is done is that you use this cystourethroscope to enter the bladder and then to enter into the ureter and then you put this stent. So usually we put this stent if we are treating the patient for stones and we expect small fragments to travel down, then we put in this stent there. Or if you know, if there is a stricture to bridge that stricture, or sometimes if you are doing a colorectal cancer surgery or a major sarcoma resection, then the urologist first puts in stents so that the surgeon who is operating from outside can identify the ureter and they don't damage the ureter. So the correct answer here would be a cystourethroscope, not a cystourethroscope. This is cystourethroscope. Then there was another histopathology image which was given where they had given that a patient with flank pain, hematuria, history of flank pain and hematuria and the histology image was shown, right? And they had asked you the diagnosis. So this typical histology image, you can see these plant-like cells and raisin-like nucleus and these cells are typically seen in chromophobe cancer and this cancer, these cells are rich in mitochondria. So this is classical of chromophobe RCC. So clear cell we know are glycogen rich cells, right? And glycogen gets dissolved during preparation of the slide. So that is why they appear clear. And clear cell is the most common type of RCC. Chromophobe RCC we know has the best prognosis. Papillary RCC, you will see samoma bodies. Samoma bodies which are foci of dystrophic calcification. You can see pap in papillary RCC like you can see in papillary thyroid cancer. So chromophobe we know you can see this in Berthog dube syndrome occurs due to loss of multiple chromosomes which are there and histopathology I have told you plant like cells and raisin like nucleus. Cytokeratin is positive in these patients and this has the best prognosis. So this is what the slide looks like. You have to always differentiate it from an oncocytoma, which is a benign tumor of the kidney. A mother brought a three-year-old, three-month-old child. Uh, again, we are not very certain about uh, what age was asked, but it was a male child who was unable to pass urine and similar history 15 days back. And some students said that there was a history of urinary tract infections as well, UTI as well. Now, what they had mentioned was that catheter could be passed without any difficulty. What is the management? And they had shown an image in which classically you could see the keyhole defect, right? You could see the keyhole defect here. This is the keyhole defect and we know the keyhole defect is seen in posterior urethral valves. And posterior urethral valves are also typically seen in males. So posterior urethral valves, you know we have to just carry out fulgration of the valves, right? Fulgration of the valves is the correct answer. You have to burn them. 
Now, these posterior urethral valves, you need to understand, they act as one-way valves. Means, if the child wants to pass urine, then the door will shut. It will not allow urine to go through. But if you put in a catheter or a scope from outside, then the door opens comfortably, which is what they had mentioned, that catheter could be inserted easily. But the child is having obstruction. That's because this is a one-way valve. You have a Young's classification for posterior urethral valves. You don't need to know the details. You just need to know that type 1 is the most common, which occurs just below the veru montanum. There are three types. Type 1 is the most common. And the typical presentation is recurrent UTIs or obstruction as they had mentioned. And you get the keyhole defect on ultrasound and on MCU, micturating sister urethrogram. You get the keyhole defect in both and that is what they had shown. And the management is fulgration. You just have to burn the valves so that the urinary passage opens up. This was a straightforward question. This has been asked multiple times. This was a clear image of bladder extrophy or ectopia vesicae or bladder extrophy image was asked. You know this happens when the there is a deficient anterior abdominal wall and deficient anterior wall of the bladder below the umbilicus. So you will see the posterior wall of the bladder exposed like this and you see urine dribbling out. Now these children also have pubic diastasis means the pubic bones are far apart in them and to correct this pubic diastasis, this question was asked many years back in the exam to correct this we have to do an iliac osteotomy. We have to cut the iliac bones to get these pubic bones close to each other. These patients can also have undescended testis in males. They can have undescended testis in males. In females, they can have bifid clitoris. They can have a bifid clitoris in females. And they can have congenital inguinal hernias as well. Congenital inguinal hernias can also be there. And the primary defect is deficient anterior abdominal wall below the umbilicus. Multiple surgeries are required to correct this abnormality. Omphalocele and gastrocystis, we all know about. These are abdominal wall defects. Omphalocele will have a sac and this is, comes, comes out through the umbilicus. Gastrocystis does not have a sac. And this is lateral to the umbilicus, right? So, they have also been asked in the exam. Now, another question from urology was that they had given a past history of tuberculosis and now the patient has dysuria and sterile pyuria. So, sterile pyuria, you know, is classical for renal tuberculosis in which you will see pus cells on routine microscopy, but the culture sensitivity is sterile because we know the TB bacteria does not grow on routine cultures. And they had shown an endoscopy image and they had shown that the ureteric orifice is dilated. We know that in tuberculosis, you get a golf hole ureteric orifice and this golf hole ureteric orifice leads to reflux of urine. Ureterocele has been asked many times in the past that presents as cobra head or adder head appearance. So that comes as cobra head or adder head appearance. Now, what I want to, you to realize is that in all the questions, they had given so many keywords and clues in the question stem itself that even if you're not very clear about the image, you can still answer the question, right? Which is why whenever we are teaching, we focus on these keywords. And for every topic, it is my sincere request to all of you going forward, those who are going to prepare for next year watching this video, please remember that whenever you underline, always follow a routine or a standard color scheme and the keywords should be highlighted with a particular color so that every time you realize you know that these are the keywords which I need to remember for the exam. Right, so you know these are the problems in renal tuberculosis where you can get a papillary ulcer, you can get a perinephric abscess, you can get a putty kidney, right, putty kidney or if this kidney becomes calcified, pus filled kidney that is a non-functioning or putty kidney that has also been asked many times this image of putty kidney has been asked where you can see calcification in the kidney this was asked in a recent exam as well features hematuria pain 
these features would be there. They had already given that the patient had TB in the past and sterile pyuria I've already explained to you. There was another question where they had asked, uh, they had given a urine analysis and they had given crystals and these, this patient had renal colic recurrent UTI and PCNL urine analysis showed hexagonal crystals. Now these hexagonal crystals we know are seen in these are cysteine stones and cysteine stone shows hexagonal crystals which are very hard and they are difficult to break by ESWL, right? So they are very hard hexagonal crystalline lattice and it is difficult to break them up. It is difficult to break by ESWL. ESWL, you know, is extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy, which is one of the treatment modalities. So you can see here that you can have various crystals and these have been asked in various exams. So you can have struvite or stagon calculi. These are seen in triple phosphate stones and the appearance is coffin lid type, is coffin lid type. And usually you will have a history of alkaline urine, which is due to an infection due to proteus and you will have alkaline urine. These are radiopaque stones. Cysteine, I've told you, are radiopaque. They are all very hard. They are seen in acidic urine, difficult to break by ESWL. Uric acid crystals are like glass shards. You must have seen when glass breaks, it breaks into various shapes and sizes. So those are glass shards and uric acid stones are formed in acidic urine, but they are radiolucent. They are the most common radiolucent stones. Calcium oxalate stones are the most common. Calcium oxalate monohydrate are like dumbbell shaped. And these are also very hard. You know dumbbells are very hard. And calcium oxalate dihydrate are avalup shaped. And these are also formed in acidic urine. You can also have ammonium urate stones, which are seen in laxative abuse. And these are radiolucent. So the next question was regarding penile cancer. And there were actually two questions regarding penile cancer. One in session one, one in session two. And if you remember, there was a question on penile cancer last year in the NEET exam as well. Which is why we tell you that it's always important to do previous year topics rather than just questions because this time the question was very different. Both the questions are very different from last time. So here they'd given the image of an elderly male who came with a lesion over the penis and it was a stage 3 penile cancer where no clinically palpable inguinal lymph nodes were there. And they had asked what is the management? In the management, the correct answer here was penectomy with a superficial inguinal lymph node dissection. And let me just tell you the treatment so that you understand this. So, penile cancer, we know, is a squamous cell carcinoma. And usually, the patient is going to come with an ulceroproliferative growth, like you can see in the image. And the diagnosis is made by biopsy. Now, whenever we deal with penile cancer, there are two aspects to the treatment. One is treatment of the primary tumor. And the other one is removal of the lymph nodes or dealing with the lymph nodes. Now, primary tumor, if it is a small lesion, if it is a small lesion, if it is distally placed, if it is distally placed, and if we can get a stump of 2 centimeters or more, and the margin which we have to take is 0 0.5 centimeters, okay? So what I mean by this is that supposing, supposing the tumor is somewhere here and if I take a 0.5 centimeter margin here and after taking that 0.5 centimeter margin, the stump is 2 centimeters or more, then in these cases, we do a partial penectomy. We just remove part of the penis. But if it is a large tumor, if it is a large tumor, like a T3 tumor, right, T3 disease is there. If it is proximally placed and if I am not going to get a stump, which is going to be less than 2 centimeters, then we need to carry out total amputation of the penis. Then we do total amputation of the penis. Now, if you see the options here, nowhere had they given partial or uh, they ha had not given an option of partial. 
So that is because it is a large tumor and you will have to carry out total amputation of the penis in this patient. What they were concerned about is the lymph node management. Now lymph nodes, we know that the lymph nodes, it goes to the inguinal lymph nodes first, fine. And we also know that the most common cause of death is erosion of the vessels, femoral vessels due to inguinal or obturator lymph nodes which are involved. Now, if you remember, we had spoken about sentinel lymph node biopsy and we know that Cabana was the first one who described sentinel lymph node biopsy in penile cancer. But since then, sentinel lymph node biopsy has also progressed quite a bit in penile cancer. Now, if the lymph nodes are not enlarged, if the lymph nodes are not enlarged in penile cancer, then we have two options. Option number one is that we can do a dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy, a dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy and preferably using a dual marker technique. So ideally this should have been done but this was not there in the option. So if the facility for sentinel lymph node biopsy is not there or it's not there in the option for us, then we have to do a superficial inguinal clearance. This is what we do if we are unable to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy and the lymph nodes are not enlarged. Now, if they are enlarged and involved, if I have done a FNAC and they are involved, then I have two options. We can either do an ileo inguinal lymph node clearance and that was the surgery image which they had asked in session 2 which I will show you or we have the option of giving radiotherapy if we don't want to do this surgery or the patient does not want this very morbid procedure then radiotherapy can be done. So this is how we manage penile cancer and the correct answer here was penectomy with superficial inguinal lymph node dissection. This is an expected question. I've been telling you bed sores are very, very important. They had shown an image and we have discussed many times that if they show you an image and they ask you the grade, it is always going to be stage 4, stage 4 bed sore. It cannot be anything else. Here you could see the muscle. Muscle could be visualized and that is why we have a stage 4 pressure sore. We know that pressure sore most common site is ischium followed by greater trochanter followed by sacrum. And this is constant pressure of more than 30 millimeters of mercury, which gives rise to pressure sores. This is the new staging. This also I had covered in the update video. This is the new staging for bed sores. Stage 1 is non-blanchipal erythema. Stage 2 is partial thickness skin loss with exposed dermis. 3 is full thickness skin loss. And 4 is full thickness and tissue loss. That means we start you know, even the subcutaneous tissue is involved. We start seeing the muscle layer or the bone. We are dealing with stage 4 disease. Unstageable full thickness is when there is obscured full thickness skin loss. And deep tissue pressure injury is when there is persistence non-blanchable erythema, but there is no breach in the continuity of the skin. So this was a stage 4 bed sore, which we have discussed. Again, you can see muscle and this is a stage 4 bed sore, right? So you know that in these patients, we have to do debridement and we have to carry out either a flap repair or we have to carry out a vac dressing, vacuum assisted closure and there were many questions from vac dressings in this exam. You can see these are images which I've shown in the app. This is a bed sore where we've done a debridement and then a flap has been mobilized to cover up the bed sore. Prevention of bed sore, you know, patient predisposed to developing pressure sores, wheelchair bound, they should be asked to get up frequently, nutritional status should be maintained, wet area should be avoided so that maceration of the skin is not there and we know that in a bed bound patient, we should change the position for 10 minutes every 2 hours, right, 10 minutes every 2 hours position should be changed. And water or alpha mattresses, which, pre which prevent constant pressure on one side, they keep on moving, so they, uh, the pressure keeps on getting displaced. Air or water mattresses, 
they will prevent bed sores as well now this was a question where i am unable to get the question stem properly right some students are saying that it was a venous ulcer and they had asked the management of that venous ulcer some are saying that it was a burnt area and which had been debrided and they were asking how to cover up that burn area right so if it is a venous ulcer if it is a venous ulcer which was given then the best answer would be vacuum assisted closure after debridement but if it was a burns wound right burns wound you can use vac or you can do skin grafting but if it was a burns wound which has been debrided i would prefer marking split thickness skin graft so again depends on what was asked you the answer would be accordingly uh, i had varied options when uh, i was going through my uh, groups so this is vacuum assisted closure where we put an occlusive dressing and this is attached to the vac machine and you have a negative pressure of minus 120 mm of mercury to minus 125 mm of mercury and this helps in hastening the wound healing because it gets more blood into that area more healing cytokines into that area more healing materials into that area and healing occurs faster and these are the uses of vac dressing so you can see chronic non healing wounds venous ulcers without slough like i was telling you if they've been debrided burns without eschar right so like i said even in a burns wound you can use a vac dressing but classically what is written is that in a burns wound especially for a stage 3 a grade 3 burn injury which is um, involving three or four which is involving the subcutaneous tissue of the muscle layer is early debridement and split thickness skin grafting so that is why if it was a burn thing i would prefer marking split thickness skin grafting as the right answer bed sores after debridement and this has also been asked in the neat exam diabetic ulcers without osteomyelitis no osteomyelitis please okay if osteomyelitis is there you need to do an amputation again a question which um, has been covered so many times and such a frequent question where they had given an image and they had given the constituents of that fluid and they'd ask you what it was and it was ringer lactate and you know we've covered ringer lactate or hartman solution is a crystalloid and you need to remember the constituents of hartman solution or ringer lactate this you definitely need to remember sodium is 131 potassium 5 calcium 2 chloride 111 and lactate 29 millimoles per liter this has been asked many many times in the exam right so this is a screenshot from the nutrition chapter where we have discussed this there was another question from nutrition these were the uh, there were just three questions from trauma and general surgery so one was uh, which i had already asked you this was regarding complications of total parenteral nutrition in sepsis in a patient who's in the icu and we know that the most common complication here is going to be hyperglycemia yes there can be hyperlipidemia as well but the most common is hyperglycemia which we see in tpn and tpn is total parenteral nutrition total parenteral nutrition you know this can you can have central line related complications and you can have feeding regime related complications the central line related complications are pneumothorax arrhythmias thrombosis air embolism migration but the most common central line problem is catheter induced sepsis right catheter induced sepsis is the most common central line problem which is there if we talk about feeding regime hyperglycemia is the overall most common complication overall most common complication which is why you would see that those who are receiving tpn a lot of times they get some bit of insulin as well to prevent this hyperglycemia then weight gain can be there cholestasis which is why when the patient is on tpn you have to monitor liver function tests and if there is cholestasis if the bilirubin is increasing you have to withhold the tpn in these patients zinc is the most common micronutrient deficiency which is seen and refeeding syndrome you know is when excess nutrition is given to a chronically malnourished patient 
these patients can develop refeeding syndrome which is hypokalemia hypophosphatemia hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia right and out of these in the latest bailey now they've given that the driver abnormality is hypophosphatemia that is the driver abnormality plus there is fluid overload in these patients and these factors combined can give rise to arrhythmias and congestive heart failure which are the cause of death in a refeeding syndrome so these complications of tpn have been asked many times and refeeding syndrome is very important for the exam as well there was one question from trauma a man presented to the emergency after road traffic accident and was complaining of chest pain and breathing difficulty x ray was done what type of breathing would be observed in this patient and they had given an x ray of a patient with flail chest right it is not very clearly visible in this x ray but the x ray which students said they had shared had clearly flail chest where you could see multiple fractures where you could see multiple fractures in the patient and that was a x ray of flail chest which was shared right so in flail chest we know there is paradoxical chest wall movement now flail chest by definition we know the discrepancy between atls guidelines and bailey atls says fracture of two or more consecutive ribs at two or more sites and bailey says fracture of three or more consecutive ribs at two or more sites i have told you that here i prefer following the atls manual which says there is fracture of two or more consecutive ribs two or more consecutive ribs at two or more sites fine so this you can see is the flail segment right this one is the flail segment and this flail segment gets separated from the chest wall and when it gets separated from the chest wall when we breathe in we know the chest wall moves out but this segment goes in and when we breathe out the chest wall goes in but this segment goes out so it moves in the opposite direction as the chest wall which is why we call it paradoxical chest wall movement right paradoxical chest wall movement and what happens is that there can be a pulmonary contusion as well when this segment hits the lung there can be a pulmonary contusion so these are the two problems in a patient with flail chest and the leading cause of death is not the paradoxical chest wall movement that's a common mistake which students make the leading cause of death is the lung contusion it is the lung contusion which is the leading cause of death in these patients now this is the paradoxical chest wall movement which i've already explained to you and the management of these patients with flail chest initially we have to give oxygen and adequate analgesia and adequate analgesia can be given in the form of thoracic epidural right so this is the initial treatment if this is not sufficient means the respiratory rate is more than 20 per minute or the po2 is less than 60 then we have to do ippv which is intermittent positive pressure ventilation right ippv which acts as internal splinting right it is going to inflate the lungs from inside so that the segment goes into place internal splinting and if this is also not sufficient means the respiratory rate is high or po2 is low then we have to do surgical fixation then we have to do surgical fixation in these patients so these were all the questions from session 1 moving on to session 2 questions now in surgery i've already shared my analysis that session 2 was definitely more challenging even the surgery questions there were long stem questions more images and more confusing options patient underwent surgery for leg ulcer what is the mechanism by which a graft receives its nutritional supply on post operative day 3 right so we know this is a split thickness skin graft why because there was meshing right and we know meshing is done in split thickness skin grafts where you make these cuts and these cuts help in two ways we know that increases the surface area and it also prevents accumulation of fluid beneath the graft so graft you know is a piece of tissue which does not have its own blood supply 
So it is dependent on the recipient site and graph survival we've discussed in detail occurs by three manner. First, you have imbibition. Imbibition is that if this is the graph which I place and this is the recipient site. So there is just by imbibition, just by absorbing nutrients from here, this graft will survive. This is graft, this is recipient. Inosculation is two to four days. So inosculation is when small buds go out from the graft into the recipient, but there is a one-way transfer. Only upwards there is transfer. This is inosculation and this is between two to four days and this is what they had asked in the exam. They had asked day three. So you had to mark inosculation as the correct answer. Neovascularization is when new vessel formation is going to occur and this occurs after four days. This was a straightforward question asked many times, especially in INICET. They had asked about this drain. We know this is a closed suction drain, also known as a Romovac suction drain, which we've covered many times. This is a closed drain with negative pressure and it can be used after mastectomy, thyroidectomy, neck dissection. We know a smaller version is called as mini-vac. This is a mini-vac drain. And another one which has been asked in the INICT exam a lot of times is the Jackson Pratt drain, JP drain. Now, JP drain is also a closed drain. This is also a closed drain. And the difference between JP and Romovac is that you have a flat tube. You have a flat tube here. There you had a cylindrical tube and here you have a bulb, there you had a, a bag which was there which you compressed. Here there is a bulb and this JP drain is usually used after abdominal surgeries, can also be used at the places where I've told you, can be used after thyroidectomies, after head and neck surgery as well. But these are the differences which you need to remember. So the next question was regarding trauma. There was a 76-year-old elderly man who would come with confusion. He was on antihypertensive medications and on aspirin. And there was a trivial fall three weeks back. Other neurosurgical examinations were normal. CT is done. What are we looking at? So this is a classical history, you know, of SDH. SDH, subdural hematoma we know occurs in elderly patients, trivial fall, patient will come after a few weeks with altered sensorium, right? Classical of chronic SDH in which you will get a concavo convex appearance or a crescentric appearance. So this is chronic SDH which you had to mark and again you can see subdural hematoma and this was a table which I had highlighted in the revision videos as well where I had given you the key words for each of these injuries because I told you these head injury scenarios are asked. In EDH, you usually have a young patient that is high velocity impact and you get lucid interval. You know lucid interval is the period of normal consciousness between two episodes of unconsciousness that is lucid interval. So that is typically seen in EDH, can be seen in other head injuries as well. It is not pathognomic of EDH but more commonly seen in EDH. And on CT, you get a biconvex hemorrhage. Chronic SDH, elderly patient, trivial injury. Patient is normal for a few weeks and then has altered sensorium. And you get a concavo convex or a crescentric hemorrhage. Diffuse axonal injury, the key words would be high velocity impact. There would be coma with no signs of recovery. GCS not improving. And CT is normal. We know the investigation of choice here is MRI on which we see punctate hemorrhages at the grey and white matter junction, right? This is EDH, you can see here, extradural hemorrhage, young high velocity impact, that is usually arterial. SDH is usually venous and here you can see a biconvex or a lens shaped hemorrhage. This was the question regarding VAC in the second session where they had actually asked the pressure values of VAC dressing. We've already discussed minus 110 to minus 130. Normally, it is in the range of minus 120 to minus 125. Then they had asked another question, like I told you, they had asked about a venous ulcer in the previous session. They had asked about an ulcer in this session as well. And we know this is along the medial malleolus. This is along the medial malleolus. And this is also known as the gator area. You have a shallow ulcer with sloping edges. 
This is classically a venous ulcer, which you can see. Varicose ulcer, most common site I told you, the medial malleolus or great gator area, shallow ulcer with sloping edges, pale granulation tissue and pigmented margins. And we manage these venous ulcers using the Bisgard's regime. The Bisgard's regime, which is education of the patient, limb elevation. We do elastic compression stockings, regular dressings and surgery. Pentoxifilin is the drug which is the only drug which has been approved as it increases the microvascular perfusion. And remember that in these patients, antibiotics are only used if there is infection. Otherwise, overuse of antibiotics is avoided. Okay. Now, other ulcers, we know the leg ulcers, that arterial ulcers can be seen over the dorsum, can be seen on the lateral side as well. And these arterial ulcers, you will have feeble pulsation. You will have feeble or absent pulses. Pulsation would be there. There is going to be loss of hair, loss of muscle mass. So the signs of arterial deficiency are going to be there. And this can be seen on the lateral malleolus or the dorsum as well. And these arterial ulcers will have punched out edges. Will have punched out edges. Neuropathic ulcer, again, it can be seen in the sole and classically you can see it behind the ball of the great toe, ball of great toe and this can be seen in patients with diabetes mellitus which can give rise to a neuropathic ulcer or if there are decreased sensations then you can get ulcers there and these neuropathic ulcers also have punched out edges. They also have punched out edges which are there. So this is, you can see for leg ulcers, the summary which I had made in the revision videos, venous ulcers, medial malleolus or gator area, arterial pulsations would be normal, you'll see dilated veins, sensations are normal and the margins are sloping. Arterial, I've told you, absent pulsations, painful and punched out. Trophic ulcers, solar base of great toe, same for diabetic and in trophic ulcers, you might have normal pulsations because that is you decrease sensation only. In diabetic ulcers, you can have an arteriopathy component to it as well. So the pulsations would also be absent. Reduce sensations in both and there are punched out ulcers as well. Then there was a question regarding a patient who has been diagnosed with a Stanford type B aortic dissection. What is the most appropriate initial management for this patient? That is what they had asked. Now Stanford type B, so you know that there is a DeBakey and Stanford's classification for aortic dissection. and DeBakey classification type 1 is ascending plus descending thoracic aorta and this is the most common type. DeBakey type 2 is only ascending and DeBakey type 1 and 2 make up Stanford A whereas DeBakey type 3 make up Stanford B which is only descending thoracic aortic dissection. You know patient comes with chest pain which radiates to the back and whether there is a type A or type B, we have discussed in the past that the initial treatment in aortic dissection, it is because this hypertension is the one which triggers the tear. So in these patients, the first thing is permissive hypotension. Permissive hypotension, we have discussed permissive hypotension concept that we have to maintain the BP at lower limit of normal. And to carry that out lower limit of normal in these patients of aortic dissection, we will give a short acting beta blocker like esmolol. So we give a short acting beta blocker like esmolol that is given first. Then if you have a type A or 1 and 2 according to DeBakey, then you will take up the patient for a graft repair. This can be an open or an endoscopic graft repair. Whereas in type B or 3, here we will observe these patients and if there is progression, then only we carry out a graft repair. In all type 3s or B, we don't need to do a graft repair. right? So the options in these patients were bypass, percutaneous endovascular stent, balloon dilatation, administer beta blockers and intensive blood pre-monitoring. This would be the correct answer here. Give esmolol and because this is a type 3, you monitor those patients. If there is progression, then you do the removal.
So next question was regarding a mucus retention cyst. The patient comes with recurrent swelling on his lower lip for the past six months. There is history of similar lesion in the lower lip six, uh, for the past six months, which was excised. And you could see that there was a mucus retention cyst. This mucus retention cyst I've highlighted in my videos as well. You can see this is just a minor salivary gland duct which gets blocked, forms a mucus retention cyst. And for such mucus retention cyst, we will have to carry out excision for these patients. This is the ranula. Ranula we know is a mucus extravasation cyst, right? So ranula is a mucus extravasation cyst which involves the sublingual salivary gland, right? And this is going to present as a bluish swelling in the floor of the mouth and this is brilliantly transilluminant swelling, fine? So this here the management is excision of cyst plus sublingual salivary gland of sublingual gland as well. Plunging ranula is a mucus retention cyst. This is a mucus retention cyst we know and this is going to involve the sublingual and the submandibular salivary gland. So the patient will come with an oral plus neck swelling. Patient comes with oral plus neck swelling and the management here is excision of the intraoral swelling plus aspiration of the neck swelling. We are not excising the neck swelling. It is excision of the intraoral swelling plus aspiration of the neck swelling. So you should know this about plunging ranula, ranula and mucus retention cysts. This was a case where they had given a chronic tobacco chewer who came with an ulcerative nodular lesion 4 into 5 centimeters in the buccal mucosa, right? So in the buccal mucosa and, and the lip junction is what students are saying the image was given. What investigation would you do to confirm the diagnosis? So we know brush is out, superficial incisional is out, excisional biopsy is out. We have to do a deep incisional biopsy and we always carry out an edge or a wedge biopsy. Wedge or edge biopsy. From here you will take you will take some part of normal tissue as well and the edge. I've always told you that the center is necrotic. So we don't take a biopsy from the center. We take it from the edge of the ulcer. That is called an edge or a wedge biopsy. Another question from head and neck. This was a simple question. A woman noticed a swelling in the neck two months back. Clinical examination showed a solitary nodule in the right thyroid lobe. What is the most appropriate initial investigation? So we know any thyroid problem, the initial investigation will always be thyroid function test. So that would be the correct answer. We will do a thyroid function test and you can see this flow chart. This can help you that if you have a possible thyroid nodule, we will do thyroid function tests. Thyroid function tests would be done first. Plus, we will do an ultrasound, right? So, first thing would always be thyroid function test plus ultrasound. Now, if TSH measurement shows low TSH, means there is hyperthyroidism, then before we do an FNAC or before any intervention, we will do a thyroid scan. If it is a hot nodule, we manage it, manage the hot nodule accordingly. If it is a cold nodule, or TSH is normal or high, then we have to do an FNAC. So this is the management or the workup of a thyroid patient. But first, we always do thyroid function tests in these patients. The next question was also very straightforward. A patient came with headache, repeated episodes of blood pressure and tachycardia. Urine shows increased vinyl mandelic acid, which we know can increase in pheochromocytomas. CT revealed a retroperitoneal tumor in the right lumbar region. Which of the following statements is true? So just by looking at the question stem, we know we are dealing with pheochromocytoma because you have a patient with elevated uh, blood pressure, you have vinyl mandelic acid in the urine, we are dealing with pheochromocytoma. Now, it is commonly seen as a bilateral condition? No. It is most commonly malignant? No. It is most commonly seen in children? No. It can be associated with Mentua syndrome? Yes. Now, I know that Dr. Rakesh Nair always says that the rule of 10 is out, right, in pheochromocytoma, but I always say it is there in Bailey. And you know the rule of 10 for pheochromocytoma is 
it is 10% bilateral, 10% malignant, 10% in children and 10% extra adrenal. So, this question could have been answered by that rule of 10 because we know that only 10% are bilateral, 10% are malignant, only 10% are seen in children, but we know it is associated with MEN2 syndrome. MEN2, you know, is red proto-oncogene mutation which is there and it is seen on chromosome 10. You have MTC only, medullary thyroid cancer only, which is usually due to exon 618 mutation on red PTC. Then you have red protongogene. Then MEN2A is also known as Sippel syndrome. And you have medullary thyroid cancer here, which is the most common. You have parathyroid adenoma, pheochromocytoma, and megacolon. And here the mutation is on exon 634. MEN2B is also known as MEN3 and here you have 5 M's. Medullary thyroid is the most common. Marfanoid features, mucosal neuromas, megacolon and medulated corneal nerve fibers. And the exon mutation is 918 and we know that the medullary thyroid cancer which is seen in 2B is the most aggressive type. Right, so this is what a pheochromocytoma looks like. These are the syndromes that can be associated with MEN2. Neurofibromatosis 1, VHL and familial paraganglionoma syndrome. So the next question was from urology. You had a male child who had experienced acute scrotal pain while playing and he was taken to the emergency department and an ultrasound was done followed by immediate surgical exploration. And this is what was found in the surgical exploration. You could see a testis which was gangrenous, which was completely black. What is the possible diagnosis? Why did it become black? Because of torsion. Right, torsion with gangrene is the correct answer. You will not have a strangulated inguinal hernia. You will have a history of a swelling which reduces cuff impulse reducibility. That was not given. A testicular hematoma, you will have a history of trauma. There is no history of trauma which is given here. So this is also out. And torsion of testicular appendage with gangrene just gives a blue dot sign. You will just see a small appendage with a blue dot sign, not the entire testis becoming gangrenous. So this is due to testicular torsion and testicular torsion. The risk factors are bell clapper testis, which is high investment of tunica vaginalis, testicular inversion, undescended testis and torsion of the cyst of morgagony, which I told you is a vestigial structure over the testis and you just get a small blue dot sign there. Bell clapper testis is the most common cause of which predisposes to torsion. This is what bell clapper testis looks like. High investment of tunica vaginalis. The clinical signs which can help us in differentiating this from epididymoarchitis. Epididymoarchitis is inflammation of the epididymis and the testis which can occur due to either chlamydia or E. coli or secondary to urinary infection. Here, if we do the PREN sign, if we lift the involved testis, pain reduces in epididymochitis, increases in torsion. Deming sign is Deming sign is that the testis which has undergone torsion will lie at a higher level. Right? You remember during childhood when we used to sit on the swings and we used to go front and back. But some days when we were being mischievous, we used to turn the swing round and round. And when we used to turn the swing round and round, we used to go above the ground. So the same thing is happening with the testis. The testis is rotating, so it lies at a higher level. And angel sign is transversely placed testis. So these three signs help us in differentiating testicular torsion from epididymoarchitis. And these are the updates regarding torsion in the latest Bailey. That 720 degree twist, twist cause more rapid ischemia than 360 degree twist. And if the testis can be untwisted within 6 hours of torsion, there is a 100% chance of salvage, but only a 20% chance of salvage if it is delayed for more than 24 hours. You know that whatever surgery we do on the affected side, whether we do an orchidectomy if it is gangrenous, like it was shown in the image, or we do a derotation and 3-point fixation, we should always carry out a prophylactic orchidopexy. We should always do a prophylactic orchidopexy on the other side. 
whenever we are dealing with testicular torsion. Right, so this was regarding the question regarding torsion. Then you had a question regarding urethral stricture. There was a 45 year old male with acute retention of urine which was drained through the suprapubic root. An RGU, retrograde urethrogram, shows a stricture. Now, in the retrograde urethrogram, we can see here that this long segment is the penile urethra. Then this bend which is there, this is the bulbar urethra. Okay, this is the bulbar urethra which is there. Then you have the membranous urethra and then you have the prostatic urethra. So you can see here that there's a stricture in the entire bulbar urethra which is there, right? So there's a bulbar urethral stricture which is there. They are asking what is the most appropriate management. Now in strictures, if it is a short, incomplete stricture, if it is a short, incomplete stricture, we do OIU or VIU. This is visual internal urethrotomy where you go from inside endoscopically and you just cut the strictured portion and you dilate the urethra. Now, if it is a short and complete stricture, then we can do excision with end-to-end -end anastomosis. Excision with end-to-end -end anastomosis. But if it is a long segment stricture like this one, if it is a long segment stricture where the entire bulbar urethra is strictured, then you have to do excision plus buccal mucosal graft, right? You have to put a graft, you have to use a tissue to bridge the gap and we use a buccal mucosal graft more commonly. You can use the penile foreskin as well, but buccal mucosal graft is the best. So that is the correct answer. You have to carry out what is known as urethroplasty. Urethroplasty with a graft from the buccal mucosa will be the correct answer in these patients. This is just an RGO showing a stricture which we've discussed. End-to-end -end anastomosis is done when there's a short complete stricture, but we do a buccal mucosal graft when there's a long stricture. This was another question. I told you penile cancer, they had asked one question in session one. There was another question in session two. They had given an image where they had removed the penis and there was a cut on both the sides of the thigh as well and in the inguinal region. So let's see the options. Let's see if we can eliminate, even if we don't know the image. Hernia repair, you know it will only be in the inguinal region, either on one side or both sides. Sentinel lymph node biopsy is out, you don't make such a big incision for sentinel lymph node biopsy, fine. Bilateral orchidectomy with inguinal dissection, you can see that the testes are still there. So we have not done an orchidectomy. So it is a total penectomy. Clear cut penis is out. So there was only one option. If you just saw that the penis is out, it is total penectomy with bilateral inguinal, ileoinguinal dissection, which is there. Then this is a question where again I have mixed views from students regarding what kind of an image was asked. So I am just going with what most of the students had shared. Again, uh, this might vary. You might have a different opinion about it. If you do, please write it in the comment section. I'll be happy to correct it in the app. A patient presented with dysuria and increased frequency of micturition. He has a history of recurrent UTI with proteus species. The radiographic image is shown. So we know proteus, we discussed that proteus or infected urine is going to give rise to triple phosphate stones, right? Triple phosphate or staghorn or struvite stone. Now the image is not matching, although you have a staghorn stone on this side. But I don't know if the image is matching or not. So like I've told you, if it's different, please write down in the comment section. So there was a next question where they had given that a patient came with a history of dyspnea and his CT scan image was shown. And in that CT scan image, they had shown a mediastinal mass. Now, you know, mediastinal mass is a very important uh, and thymoma has been asked many times, but this time they did not ask thymoma. This time, the image which they had asked was a teratoma. And I'm just going to show you a better image because I exactly don't know which image was asked. I'm just going to show you a better image of mediastinal teratoma. Here you can see the teratoma in the mediastinum. And this teratoma, you know, it is, the, it is a germ cell tumor which is there in the anterior mediastinum. Anterior mediastinum, we know it is the most common is a thymoma. But... You can even get a teratoma. This is what Yuvraj Singh also had. 
Now this is formed in the anterior mediastinum. It can be seen with Kleinfelter syndrome. And the radiological findings which we need to look out here are that you will see fat. And how will we see fat? Fat we will see as black. So this black which we see is the fat. And this white which we see is the calcium. So you will see a mixture of fat and calcium. And this is what makes the diagnosis of a teratoma. So this is what was asked in the option that you had a mediastinal mass with fat and calcification. Let's look at the other options. You can have a mediastinal mass compressing vascular structures. This could be any lymph node, any cancer, right? Thrombosed arch of aorta, you would have an arch of aorta which would be calcified or, or thrombosed. This is not there. And mediastinal hydrated cyst, we've already discussed about the features of hydrated cyst, uh, where you can see the floating membrane sign, honeycomb appearance, all those we've discussed. So they are not there. So even with elimination, we could reach to this diagnosis. Now, mediastinal masses, we know that in the anterior mediastinum, you can get a thymoma, which is most common, right? You can get a teratoma, which I've told you. You can get a terrible lymphoma, which is there. You can get a terrible lymphoma in these patients as well. And out of these, we know thymoma is the most common in these patients. And thymoma can be associated with myasthenia gravis, as it was asked in the INICET exam. Also, what was asked was the Masoka staging, was the Masoka staging for thymomas. That has also been asked. You can see a classical thymoma here in the anterior mediastinum. Middle mediastinal masses, you can get cystic lesions most commonly. You can get pericardial bronchial cysts, which are seen in the middle mediastinum. They are the most common. And posterior mediastinal masses, the most common posterior mediastinal mass is a neurogenic tumor, is a neurogenic tumor. This is most common posterior and most common in children also is neurogenic. And you can even see lymphomas in the posterior mediastinum, but the most common is a neurogenic tumor. Now, last two questions. This was again a question where there's a bit of confusion. They had shown a hernia surgery, an open inguinal hernia surgery, where they had shown a structure which was marked with a black arrow. And this is probably the structure which was shown that, uh, you know, you are separating it out from the hernial sac. This white glistening is the hernial sac. And these are the cord structures. So you can see that this is a part of the cord structure which is being separated. And by the looks of it, it looked like a venous structure. So the best answer here would be the testicular vein or the pampiniform plexus of veins. Right? Pampiniform plexus of veins is the best answer. Obturator vein, femoral vein is out because they are much, much deeper. They don't come here. An inferior epigastric vein could have been the only one which could have caused confusion. But you know that the inferior epigastric vein would be close to the deep ring, right? Would be close to the deep ring and it would be lower down. So here they are showing the structure which is close to the sac. So the inferior epigastric vein does not come close to the sac. We know it is forming one of the boundaries of the Hasselbach's triangle and it is very close to the deep ring. So that is why testicular vein or pampiniform plexus would be the best answer. The next question was a simple one. They had shown an image of fundoplication and they had asked which fundoplication is this. This is a complete wrap as you can see. This is Nissen's 360 degree fundoplication. We know the types of fundoplication. Complete wrap is Nissen's fundoplication. And we know that the most common complication of Nissen's fundoplication is gas bloat syndrome, right? Is gas bloat syndrome because you do a complete wrap. The wrap is so tight that you can, the patient cannot even burp sometimes and that is known as gas bloat. You can have partial wraps like door, which is 180 degree anterior, toupee, which is 180 to 270 degree posterior and belse mark, which is 270 degree interior, right? So this is a classical Nissen's fundoplication, which you need to know, which is a complete. Wrap. So these were the questions which were there in the NEAT PG surgery part, session 1 and session 2, right? And like I said, most of the questions were conceptual questions. Hardly any memory-based questions uh, or, uh, were there. And this paper clearly showed that there are no shortcuts to success, 
right if you want to do well in such an exam you need to have good concepts especially of the clinical subjects it couldn't have been done with just a few days of preparation so going forward anyone who's watching this for future preparation please develop good concepts don't rush towards revision videos initially if you have time for the main subjects watch the main videos build your concepts you can always filter down things later on but if you only fill your brain with little information even that little information nobody can remember 100% so it's better to it's like a sponge right put more information here gradually squeeze it out gradually filter it as you come closer to the exam but don't be very very selective up front that would be my suggestion to all of you all the best